evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. Tonight our panel of medical experts will be taking your questions about lower GI problems. So what would you like to know about issues ranging from hemorrhoids and constipation to colitis, diverticulitis, and colon cancer? I'm Dr. Ruth Westra from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth, and I'm your host for tonight's program. We're ready to take your questions. Give us a call locally at 218-788-2844 or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, Dr. Thomas Malloy, a gastroenterologist with Essentia Health Duluth Clinic, Dr. Daniel McKee, a gastroenterologist with Northland Gastroenterology Associates in Duluth, and Dr. Thomas Opheim, a general surgeon with St. Luke's Pavilion Surgical Associates in Duluth. Our medical students will be answering phones tonight. Liz McHale from Hibbing, Minnesota, Tim Roos of Worthington, Minnesota, and Joel Soma from Harmony, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on lower GI problems. So while we're waiting for questions to come in, why don't we talk a little bit about colorectal screening and um, potentially prevention. So Dr. Molloy, can you tell us what is the appropriate age or where we would start screening for colorectal cancer? Well, generally, Ruth, we start um, screening in, in average risk populations around age 50. Um, the, by average risk populations, we're talking about uh, people who don't have a family history of colon cancer and first degree relatives and people who uh, uh, have not had colon polyps or um, any particular uh, problems or symptoms. Um, and generally with routine screening in that low risk population, we'd be looking at every 10 years after the age of 50. And how would we do that screening, Dr. McKee? Well, there are a number of different procedures or techniques that are considered appropriate, but most, I think, would agree that the uh, screening technique of choice is a colonoscopy. There are, there are tests to look for blood in the stool that can be done. They're not as accurate. Uh, occasionally, someone will still get what we call flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a similar type of exam to a colonoscopy, but it really only looks at about a third of the colon, and so obviously less useful, but colonoscopy is still the gold standard. Oh, Dr. Opheim, a lot of people are hearing about DNA testing or stool testing. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so it's a, a test uh, that we use. It's a little bit more sensitive than fecal occult. And it actually looks for not only just cancers, but also polyps. Mm -hmm. But it, And there's some studies that suggest that they catch polyps about a centimeter in size. But it's still not as good as colonoscopy at this point to actually catch smaller polyps that are actually important to catch also. So colonoscopy at this point is the most important test that we can do to try and prevent colon cancer. Well, and Dr. McKee, when we find a polyp, I mean, it's a screening test and we're looking for polyps. Why are we um, just looking for polyps? What's the reasoning in that? Well, the, the reason why we make such an issue of polyps is that the majority really probably the great majority of colon cancers originate as polyps and there's a progression from small benign polyps to larger, more aggressive, more advanced lesions and then ultimately to colon cancer. So if we can find those polyps and remove them, we can break that cycle and prevent the cancer from developing in the first place. And does it take about 10 years for a polyp to potentially change, Dr. Malloy? Well, generally, I think, I think small polyps, yes. Um, I think part of the problem with just looking at small polyps, though, is that polyps basically are asymptomatic. You don't know that you're carrying them and uh, therefore don't know that you're at risk. And uh, there are larger polyps, which may be a higher risk uh, lesion in terms of potentially containing colon cancer. Um, and so, you know, small polyps, I think, yeah, you're, it's pretty well accepted that you're talking about a five to 10 year window in which colon cancer may develop. But mm -hmm. I, I think the, the real uh, difficult thing is, is finding people who have more advanced lesions, more advanced polyps that are even higher risk. 
So that's one way that we look. Uh, what if someone comes in, they, they are now symptomatic, uh, Dr. Opine, so they have rectal bleeding, right. bright red re rectal bleeding. What are we concerned about when we see that? Well, well first we kind of gather that family history, which is fairly important. We also talk about what kind of bleeding they're having. Is it just bright red after a bowel movement that we're thinking more hemorrhoidal bleeding in nature or more distal versus black and tarry? Um, those are, are fairly important questions to delineate. And then from there, we ask if they've had a colonoscopy recently, you know, do they have a, um, a strong history of polyps? Those kind of things are important to ask those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Dr. Malloy, a, a caller from Duluth, asking about if it's safe for, or wise to use home remedies um, or enemas to relieve constipation. We'll start with that one. Well, I, I think um, one thing we have to be cautious about is, uh, is defining home remedies. Mm -hmm. um, enemas uh, or suppositories you know, are commonly available over the counter and yes, can be used for, um, for relief of constipation. I think one uh, thing that I would, uh, that I would push uh, to the forefront though would be in the patients that we're talking about now in terms of colorectal cancer screening, in patients who are at risk, it's, it's very important that constipation be evaluated. Um, and so, you know, that, that's something that's important to lose track of. Um, it is very easily, very easy to, to treat the symptoms, but it's always important to keep in the back of the mind if somebody has not had routine screening and they're in the appropriate age group, they really need to have this looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. McKee, asking about diverticulitis, mm -hmm. and we've had um, conversations in the past about foods potentially to avoid. Are there foods that should be avoided with diverticulitis, or is that really not true? It's really not true. I'm not really sure where that whole, we shouldn't eat foods with um, little seeds or nuts came into being. Um, it's not true. It really never has been true. Uh, foods like that do not cause diverticulitis. And in fact, most of those foods, if you think about it, are good sources of fiber, and they're exactly the kinds of foods that someone who has diverticular disease should be eating to reduce the risk of more diverticula or diverticulitis. So no, there are no foods you need to avoid if you've had problems with diverticular disease. Yeah, the kind of the tales about the nuts and popcorn yeah. and things there's like that. There's uh, actually something that, uh, actually looking at popcorn, there's fiber content in popcorn, which mm -hmm. actually can be protective to form, to, to prevent forming other diverticulum. So mm -hmm. the, if, if somebody came and watched a colonoscopy, they'd see a diverticulum, and then they actually see a little stool ball that's actually caught in some of the diverticulum, mm -hmm. and then they, they would see that there's never a seed in that, in that area. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a complete myth, yeah. Yep. Furthermore, the, the size of a diverticulum is, you, you could put a, a hundred tomato seeds in there or cucumber seeds. Yep. They would just, if they actually did enter, they would just wash out again harmlessly. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Well, Dr. Opheim, um, a couple of callers asking about treatments for hemorrhoids. Yeah. Uh, surgical treatments for hemorrhoids, if sure. you could talk about that a little bit. Right, that's actually the, the last kind of thing that we go over with, with a patient that comes into the office. First, uh, obviously, I kind of want to figure out, is it truly hemorrhoids? So is it uh, prolapsing of internal hemorrhoids? Is it giving people problems? Is it bleeding? And then obviously, we go down the bleeding pathway of asking questions. But the first things that we start off with is um, actually fiber supplementation and then drinking lots of water, 64 ounces a day, in which we actually prescribe patients. And uh, so the other thing that we talk about and I've already kind of mentioned is fiber um, content. So the USDA studies say we get about 15 grams of fiber a day. We need about 35 for men and about 25 for women grams. So it's really difficult in our Western society to actually get that. So what we tell people is, is fiber supplementation is the best way. Now there's a lot of good options nowadays, not just the old-fashioned Metamucil or Citrusil, mix it in with water, choke it down. A lot of different options. There's tablets, there's caps, there's gummies now. Actually, there's a really good gummy out there nowadays. I, I tell people to take, and you need to take it on a regular basis. It's not just one of these intermittent things. It's a rest of your life kind of thing. So take it in the morning, drinking lots of water. And then eventually, um, you know, spending less time on the toilet. That's actually what the problem is usually when people have hemorrhoidal issues is th that hemorrhoids are actually there an anatomically. They're supposed to be there. They're vascular cushions, they're, and they have anodermal over the top of them. And we need them, actually. They, 
contribute to about 30% of continents. So they're very important things. So, so the first things we, we tell people is we don't want to engorge those vessels for prolonged periods of time because that's when people have problems when they prolapse and bleed. So mm -hmm. that's the first things that we tell. So fiber, water, and then limiting time on the commode. And then the other things that we also talk about is banding. So if those first three things don't work for the medical management, we talk about rubber band ligation where we actually tack up the hemorrhoid complex and, uh, and that takes a couple weeks to actually work, um, but it's actually fairly successful in 95% of people. And then the last thing that we actually we talk about is hemorrhoidectomy. That's the thing that I save at the back table, just because that it's, it's a fairly uh, painful operation that I perform. And I obviously, if I can get through somebody with medications and or van ligation, I'd obviously like to do that, so, mm -hmm. yep. Very. Very excellent information. Dr. McKee, caller asking about barium tests. Do we use barium enema tests very commonly anymore, or what would we use those? Yeah, we don't use, the barium enema test is not used often. It's not considered one of the approved uh, screening modalities for colon cancer. In terms of col colorectal cancer screening, really the only role for a barium enema is if there's some anatomic or other reason why it's just physically impossible to complete a colonoscopy, one might choose to visualize the unseen areas with a barium enema. There are actually better tests than a barium enema for that purpose as well, uh, so-called CT colonos uh, colonography uh, or virtual colonoscopy, as some people refer to it, is, is a little more sensitive, a little more accurate test than a barium enema. So, Today, in 2014, uh, they're still occasionally ordered, but not as a first-line study, and the role has become pretty limited. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Malloy, um, a few callers asking, you know, you do colonoscopies for screening, yes. and then we identify that there are polyps. Then how often do we have follow-up for those polyps? Well, it, a lot depends on, on type of polyp as well as size. Um, and location in some in some circumstances, um, with very small polyps that are precancers. Well, if I should back up, our first differential in the equation is is are these adenomatous or precancerous polyps? Are these the type of polyp that could potentially grow over time and develop into colon cancer? Um, small polyps like that place patients in a, an increased risk, and generally we'll look every five years. Uh, with more complex polyps, larger polyps, um, other types of what we call histology or how they look under the microscope may also affect that and, and move that time frame to perhaps every three years um, in that circumstance. Uh, occasionally we'll have um, some patients who have very high risk lesions, uh, perhaps with uh, a focus of, of early cancer in it. Um, or very large polyps that we want to make sure are completely removed. We may have patients come back in six to 12 months simply to evaluate the area where that original polyp had been. So uh, those are some of the factors. Now, if, if they're not precancerous polyps, then people would fall into a lower risk category and we'd look every 10 years. And I might just add that the number of polyps is also important. Mm -hmm. If there are more than th three or more small polyps, then that would move you into the three year mm -hmm follow-up uh, protocol as well. And Dr. McKee, are there hereditary abnormalities, people who have family histories of polyps and then we would be more at a high risk of following up on them? Yeah, absolutely. There, uh, there's a whole range of hereditary conditions. Uh, there are conditions such as familial polyposis where while it's not common, uh, the risk of cancer is exceedingly high even at a young age, which is an inherited condition. Um, also, uh, another inherited condition with a very, very high risk of colon cancer is so-called Lynch syndrome. And then there are other, than much more common than any of those defined inherited um, polyp diseases or disorders are just family histories of polyps, where if you've had uh, immediate family members who have had precancerous polyps, especially if they had them at a young age, young being defined as less than 60, then that significantly increases your risk for polyps and cancer. Mm 
Dr. Opheim, a few callers are asking about, well, we're going to kind of stay on colonoscopy, I think, for a little sure. while here, yeah. um, the potential for perforations. And if yeah. that happens from a surgical perspective, sure. what would happen? Absolutely. So uh, literature looks at uh, the chance of a uh, perforation is about one in a thousand. Um, so it, it's always there. It, it's a, it is in the literature and it is de definitely defined. Now, it all depends on what type and what kind of perforation. So sometimes if you have a difficult colonoscopy getting around the sigmoid colon, because that's usually the first place that we, we worry about when somebody comes complaining of abdominal pain after a colonoscopy, because it's a fairly tight angulation around the, uh, around the rectum, and especially if somebody's had prior operations. Uh, female, uh, females are a little bit uh, harder to colonoscopy, and then skinny uh, or thinner people. Um, so usually if it's, uh, they can present early or they can present later down the road, usually when it's sometimes when we take off a polyp and we use energy, we use thermal energy to take off a polyp and they can present further down the road, you know, three to four to five days down the road. Mm -hmm. So they can, can present different ways. Um, and then usually the common presentation is, is abdominal pain, sometimes fevers if it's further down the road. but. Um, it's it's one of those things that it's not a subtle thing I mean, you would know and, and obviously in in when we do colonoscopies we always have phone numbers for the, for the patient to call to let them know um, and and when to call so excellent so dr. Malloy a few more questions about screening here sure. um, I've had about three questions asking about when to stop so one about you know in age 70 78 if you, what's the age that we would stop? And then is there a follow-up that you would do once you don't get colonoscopies anymore to check? Well, this, this is one of the real hot button uh, questions in our, our field these days. And I, th I think it makes sense because if you go back to the original premise we were talking about with polyps growing over many years and developing into cancer, obviously you reach a point where there's a certain age where small polyps may not cause somebody trouble down the line. And in that circumstance, the risk of doing the procedure may outweigh the benefit um, to that particular individual. Um, what age is that? Uh, well, that's, that's up to debate to some extent. I think some of the, um, um, some people would suggest 70, some would suggest 75, and you still occasionally hear people at 80 Personally, I, I'm not sure that there's a line in the sand. Different uh, of our organizations recommend different ages. Um, I, think, I think you have to look at a couple of things. One would be risk, uh, risk factors. Um, is this a patient who's had polyps? Is this a patient who's had colon cancer? Or is this a patient without a family history who's had one or two screening colonoscopies that have been normal? Mm -hmm. um, so I think you have to stratify people into, into the, their risk categories. Uh, number two, I think you have to also look at other medical problems that that particular individual may have. Do they have cardiac disease? Do they have lung disease? Uh, which may impact their risk for the procedure f safely. Um, third thing I always, I always uh, think about too is personal preference and I have plenty of people who at 75 will tell me, well, you know, I'm done. I, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I, I'm not sure that there's a right or a wrong on that. I think that's a personal um, choice. I do think uh, one thing we have to keep in mind is that hopefully we're all living longer these days. And if you have a higher risk patient, sometimes it can be very difficult to tell them, um, you know, that, well, you're 75 and maybe you don't need to have this done. but in your particular case, you've had polyps before, you've had cancer before, and it may be worth that colonoscopy at 75 uh, if you're a higher risk patient. So I think you have to look at those sorts of individual questions too, but it's, it's a very difficult thing to, uh, and, and there are many people out there who, who um, many patients out there who uh, with, uh, at 75 or 80 don't want to go through it either, so that has to be taken into account. Yeah, there are a few questions about the prep, if we know of any mm -hmm. other easier preps on people um, other than the routine prep that we're doing. It seems the prep is one of the harder things of having a colonoscopy. Well, I, I would say that um, there are some easier preps in terms of volume. Mm -hmm. um, there are some smaller volumes. Currently, we, we uh, split uh, the, the old preps that we used to do into um, half the night before half the day of the exam. 
uh, and there are some other much smaller volume uh, preps. But, you know, I think the thing to keep in mind is that, uh, number one, none of them are palatable, and two, they're all going to achieve the same uh, end result, so to speak. Um, and so there's no perfect prep. Um, and, it, and we should probably talk about prep being vitally important. Um, we're limited as to what we can see if, if a prep's not good. And so um, I always stress that to people. I, I, want them to, uh, I want them to do a good job with the prep so that I can be sure that I'm telling them that they don't have to come back for five years or 10 years or whatever and, and uh, yeah, not have missed something. Plus yeah. agree with that. Yeah, that's a, a great, great, great uh, answer. I mean, the biggest thing is if they don't have a, a good prep, you know, they're at risks of missing a lesion. So if they don't have a great prep, they potentially would need another colonoscopy within re current recommendations is within a year's time. So, you know, that's the most important job that they can do to, to, to you know, try and prevent colon cancer. Mm -hmm. They can think of it that way. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's switch topics just a little bit. Um, Dr. McKee, I have a caller from Duluth asking about colitis. If you could describe that, um, symptoms that would be related to that, and if you have any good treatments for that. Sure. It's, it's a pretty broad topic, yeah, actually. Okay. Colitis simply means inflammation or irritation of the colon wall and, or colon lining. And there are many, many types of colitis. Uh, colitis could be due to an infection with a particular kind of bacteria. There are um, long-term chronic types of colitis, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis. And then there are milder types of colitis uh, with less inflammation, such as microscopic colitis. And there are others, too. So it's hard to give an answer to, to just, you know, what do we do with colitis? But I can't think of any type of colitis where there are not effective treatments. But the treatment varies depending on, on the underlying cause. Uh, Dr. Opai McCuller asking about anal fistulas. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So uh, kind of back up a little bit. A fistula is uh, an epithelial tract between two epithelial structures, usually caused by what we call cryptoglandular abscess. So you get a, what we call a perirectal abscess uh, related to one of the glands that gets plugged. It's kind of like appendicitis in that fact that uh, you have glands all the way around your anal canal at the, what we call the dentate line and the crypts. And what happens is that gets plugged and then eventually you get an abscess. And then in about 50% of those people, so it's almost, it's a flip of the coin, will develop a fistula. And that's that connection that usually presents with persistent drainage, usually kind of sometimes bloody, sometimes just a clear fluid, or sometimes more of a purulent material. Um, and usually some, and most people come in just complaining of persistent bleeding mm -hmm. or just drainage, so. Um, Dr. McKee, a caller asking about stool changing in color of the stool. Is there significance when we're looking at the stool coloration? Sometimes. I find that a, a number of patients will come in and, and what they're describing in terms of color change is really minor and within the range of normal. But the, I guess the color changes that are almost always important if a patient has black stools and they're not using iron or Pepto-Bismol, that is usually indicative of a bleeding source somewhere in the upper digestive tract or maybe the very upper part of the colon. That's obviously important and requires investigation. Stools sometimes with certain conditions that block the flow of bile, so cancers in the pancreas, cancers in the bile duct, or liver disease can cause very light so-called clay-colored stools and that would be something that would be important to investigate. When that happens, usually the urine is a very dark cola color. So if you have those two situations in conjunction, that would uh, be something that would require investigation as well. But just changes in shade from light brown to dark brown generally is not of any significance at all. But like a black stool or something, that, that would have a more significance to it. Yep, absolutely. Um, we'll just end with this last one because uh, several callers are asking about sedation and colonoscopies and how we employ sedation. Um, do you want to take that, Dr. Malloy? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, generally, we use a technique called conscious sedation uh, or moderate sedation um, in in many cases, and and that's kind of been the old 
traditional standby for many years. And in that, it, it's just like it sounds, uh, a patient is, is conscious to this from the extent that they can breathe on their own. Um, they may have some awareness of things that are going on in the room, uh, but they're comfortable. Um, and, it, and it involves a combination of pain medication and relaxing medication. Uh, it also, those medications uh, combined have an amnesia effect, so most people don't remember much about the uh, test. Um, there is another form of um, sedation called deep sedation, uh, which I at least in this, in this uh, community is typically given by an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist and takes the patient to a little bit deeper level. Um, obviously that does uh, involve um, more monitoring. It involves another physician to, uh, or a nurse anesthetist to give the medication rather than simply the endoscopist. That does increase the cost of the procedure to some extent. Um, but there are some situations where that's preferable. Um, for example, there are medications, uh, pain medications, psychoactive medications that one might be on that interfere with the usual moderate sedation. And in that uh, situation, uh, uh, deeper sedation would be a, a good choice. Occasionally, we will use general anesthesia, but that's not a common, yeah. common thing. Oh, well, very good. Well, I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Thomas Malloy, Dr. Daniel McKee, and Dr. Thomas Opheim, and our medical students, Liz McHale, Tim Roos, and Joel Soma. There will not be a program the next two weeks. Please join, join Dr. Alan Johns on December 11th for a program on ENT problems, when his panelists will be Dr. David Choquette, Dr. Jake Pranowski, and Dr. Mark Rhodes. Thank you for watching, and good night. Thank you.